Before we start, I should uh, explain. This video was intended to be about Deadly Shadows, but I had a lot of trouble getting the game to work, even with the sneaky upgrade, so I decided that we're gonna talk about Deadly Shadows here in the beginning real quick, and then jump into the uh, 2014 reboot. If you remember, last time uh, Looking Glass Studios had to close their doors because of financial issues after releasing Thief 2. The Thief series, however, was planned to be a trilogy. Here it only had two entries and the studio making the game was uh, closed. But when they closed, the development of Thief 3 had already started. The idea was to make an open world Thief game where the player would uncover the plot gradually. The plot would focus on the Keepers and Garrett would turn into a giver rather than a taker. The Thief IP went down with Looking Glass so the future of this game was uncertain to say the least. Three months later in August 2000, Eidos Interactive announced that they had uh, bought the rights to Thief and that Thief 3 would be made by Ion Storm and led by uh, Warren Spector who had recently made Deus Ex. Quite a few ex-employees of Looking Glass was hired. After the team was built, they began pre-production in September. Pre-production lasted around half a year. Iron Storm reported that uh, everything was going well and that they had started developing a tech demo. The design and story concepts of Looking Glass's Thief 3 was used as a baseline for this game. The game would be released on May 25th, 2004. Despite the game's uh, positive reception, it failed to meet financial goals, which led to the cancellation of Thief 4 and, as if the IP itself was cursed, Iron Storm had to close their doors in February 2005. Thief was put on indefinite hiatus. You once again play as Garrett. After stealing a nobleman's opal, he is contacted by the keepers who offer him access to a prophecy if he can get them two artifacts one from the Hammerites and one from the Pagans. Garrett learns about a coming dark age and steals the Compendium of Reproach, which is a book that describes it in more detail. They read the book and learn of an evil one that will be revealed when time ceases to exist. Garrett has a gut feeling that they meet the clock tower in the city. He sabotages it and causes it to collapse. The Keeper's interpreter is found murdered and Garrett gets found guilty by Keeper Orland, who, but he escapes. He is then contacted by sympathetic Keepers that reveal to him that the clock tower rubble points towards a Keeper library. Believing that Orland's betrayal was foretold, he goes in there. In the library, Garrett gets jumped by a magic old woman. He escapes and meets with Drept, of the Hammers. He identifies the woman as a hag and tells Garrett to go to Shalebridge because he saw the hag there once. The Shalebridge Cradle was once an orphanage and asylum but was abandoned after a fire. At the Cradle, Garrett meets Laurel, a spirit that looks like uh, Gamal who is to become the new Keeper Interpreter. Garrett helps free Laurel but then he finds that uh, he can't leave himself because the Cradle remembers him. Garrett tricks it by making it think he died by jumping out of a window. Garrett finds Laurel's tomb, which has uh, glyphs on it, left by Gamal. Gamal killed Laurel to take her appearance so she could become interpreter and destroy the Keepers. At Gamal's interpreter ceremony, it's revealed that she is a monster and she attacks the Keepers. Gamal gets the final glyph and steals the chalice and the paw from the Keepers. Those were the two artifacts that Garrett stole in the beginning. Garrett steals them back, however, and discovers that you can activate the final glyph by uh, placing five Keeper artifacts around the city. Gamal wants to destroy it. Garrett goes out to steal them. After getting his hands on them, he is stopped by Keeper Artemis. It turns out to be uh, Gamal in disguise and she kills Orland. Meanwhile, Garrett activates the final glyph and all glyph magic ceases to exist. In the end, a little girl tries to pickpocket Garrett and he obviously notices. He repeats the same words that uh, Keeper Artemis spoke to him as a young boy. In 2009, it was announced that Thief 4 was in early development. 
it would be developed by Eidos Montreal. The game was in the concept phase for quite a while, where the team considered various mechanics like parkour or having the game in third person or uh, taking Garrett out of the picture completely. Randy Smith, a designer on the original trilogy, liked the idea very much, saying that if they wanted to expand the world, they should show it from a different person that lives like Garrett. The game wouldn't be formally announced until March 2013. Here it was also revealed that it was not the 4, but a reboot of the series. The studio already faced a backlash when it was revealed that uh, veteran voice actor Steven Russell, who played Garrett in the original trilogy, would be replaced by uh, Romano Osari. The reason for this was that uh, they used mocap, so they needed a younger, athletic guy to play Garrett. The game was released on the uh, 25th of February 2014. The game was met with average reviews. Some said it was a pretty good stealth game, but Thief fans will definitely be disappointed. Romano Osari also uh, got some flack. It was said that he was uh, flat and boring to listen to. The thing most people had a problem with was how the freedom that made the previous Thief game stand out is close to absent in this game. The layout of the city was confusing and the missions were too linear. Now with that out of the way, let's jump into the game and discover why it truly was so... meh. The game starts with this beautiful shot overlooking the city. The sky is dark and everything is coated in a dim yellow light. It's a very cool way to start the game. We hear Garrett narrate over it. He gives a basic rundown of his nature and how it relates to the setting of the game. Then you get control of Garrett in this room with a sleeping man and a lot of loot. Here you learn the raw basics of the game. How to move, how to stay silent, how to interact with the environment and most importantly, how to steal. Looking at this game, it really reminds me of Dishonored. Everything has at least a tinge of darkness. In the original trilogy, the atmosphere was also dark, but it played more with different colors and lighting. And lighting. It was more vibrant. You can hear the city go about its business outside as you loot this man's home. Eventually, you decide enough is enough, and you make your way outside. The city is in the middle of a carnival. You walk across to the window across the street where you enter this room. Here you learn a mechanic. Animals. They function a lot like the cameras in the Metal Age in that you have their attention for... If you have their attention for too long, they alert everyone in the area. You have to pass them as silently and slow as possible. You're also introduced to picture frames. Here you gotta feel around for a switch to reveal what it hides. After that, you learn the lockpicking minigame. It's really easy. Already before the game's midpoint, you're gonna be flying through the whole minigame. But they do add an extra layer of tension. Let's say you're in a really tense situation and you gotta lockpick this door before you're spotted. The stress can easily make you fumble the minigame. Inside the safe, you find this necklace. You're immediately interrupted by thumping on the roof. Someone is running across out there, and Garrett thinks he knows who it is. This is Erin. She used to be an orphan until she was taken in by Garrett. They worked together closely and eventually split up, where she uh, became a contract killer. From, he from her, we find out that Garrett is currently doing a job for Basso, and he has to work with Erin. Also, she runs weird. If you remember, Basso was the guy we wingmanned in the beginning of Thief 2. Next, we have this section where we run across the city's rooftops. It's honestly a really cool section. You learn more advanced movement and uh, get a proper feel for the city. It does feel insanely out of character having just played the original Thief games. The originals were so slow paced and tense. Patience was a requirement. So this section kind of makes you forget you're playing a thief game. After that, we get a bit of a banter between the two where we get a feel for their dynamic. Eren has a very lighthearted approach to this line of work and Garrett is very cold and serious. 
Shortly after that, we get to uh, the, these uh, two guards. Erin has this clawed blackjack that makes her able to climb better. You don't have it, so you have to take the tough route. Atop this building, we meet Erin again. She brags about the claw, but its noisiness leaves Garrett unimpressed. We have a very basic writing dynamic here, I guess. We have the young, overconfident character and the old, cynical, but wiser character. Shortly after that, Erin challenges you to a loot off. You gotta steal more than her. It's now completely dark out. The atmosphere has taken a more sinister turn. You go through these buildings where you just creep around and steal stuff. You also find private diaries and notes laying around. You also overhear a conversation between a woman and this drunk guard pissing in the street. At least do it out of the light. Everybody can see you. <laughs> the ale has to go somewhere, dear. I'm just the middleman. When we meet Erin again, we get to know more about the job we're on. Basso wants a primal stone from the ceremony room in Northcrest Manor, which is the Baron's house. Garrett is visibly worried, but Erin stays brash. You arrive at Northcrest Manor. It's heavily guarded. Now you have your first real stealth section. Here you learn how to do these quick dashes across lit areas. This game is beginning to feel more and more like a Dishonored copy rather than an actual thief game. Then you learn to creep across loud surfaces for minimal sound. In this game you also have a variety of arrows to choose from. Water arrows, choke arrows and fire arrows make a return alongside new types. After making your way across the garden, Garrett and Erin knock out two guards. Upon further investigation, Garrett finds that Erin killed one of them. Garrett gets mad. Erin argues that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, but Garrett states that he doesn't kill without good reason. Erin points out that it's only okay when Garrett does it, which honestly is a little weak. Having spent the last month only playing Thief, I can count the amount of people I've killed on one hand. Garrett is quite different in this game. He's still cynical but has a moral code that he follows to a T. And he doesn't only think about himself. When we first meet Garrett in the Dark Project, he is very self-centered. You move closer to your target. Here I wanna say that I really don't like the rope arrows in this game. In the originals they would stick to all wooden surfaces, but here you have to shoot them at designated beams. By limiting Garrett's gadgets they've robbed the game of the freedom that made the originals so great. When you meet Garrett on this roof they have another argument. Garrett says she isn't in control, but Erin says that that's what makes her better than Garrett. In response to this, Garrett simply steals her claw right off her belt without her noticing. Then we get a cutscene. Garrett and Erin move up to the skylight on the roof and look down into the ceremony room where the Baron is in the middle of channeling the primal stone to bring a new age of industrial enlightenment. When they begin doing their magic, Garrett decides the job is too dangerous and begins to leave. Erin decides to go for the stone without him, but then Garrett reveals that he has her claw. As they wrestle the claw, they are spotted by the guards and the claw ends up on the skylight. Erin goes after it, but the glass breaks. Garrett tries to save her, but she slips and falls straight into the primal stone. Garrett falls as well, but ends up catching himself. He swings straight into the light as the building collapses. You wake up in this cart of corpses that's being dragged by two men that seem determined to get Garrett inside the city before it locks down. As we get into the city, a horrific scene awaits. Dying people line the streets and we hear of the gloom. The gloom is a plague that has hit the city hard. You come across a scene where a man is being apprehended by the city watch while screaming about someone named Orion and how he will fix the city. Then the cart carriers rush through the guards who kill one of them and the other runs away. As we watch the guards go after him, Garrett emerges from the cart. The drop is basically just a tutorial. Even from that it feels very different from the originals, except for the graphics it doesn't feel like 
any kind of improvement. It feels like a simplification of the original games. I did, however, like the rooftop running. We haven't been able to move that quickly through the city in any Thief game yet. But it did feel very out of place in a Thief game. Story-wise, we meet Garrett and Eren. We see the event that starts this game off. They're trying to steal the primal stone for Basso when it uh, goes sideways and Eren ends up encapsulated in, uh, by some uh, sinister magic. In the end, we get a taste of the game to come. The city is run down and suffering from a plague. There is a lot of unrest and instability in the social and political climate. For an opening mission, it's pretty cool. Still not ready. This is the first real chapter in the game. You have to get back home in the clock tower. Garrett has just escaped the cart. Now you gotta move through the dark streets of the city. When you make it up and out of the alley you start in, you get this very moody shot overlooking the city. It's a really cool moment. If there is one big compliment that you can give this game, it's that the atmosphere and visual style is incredible. It's very unlike the one in the originals, but still really well done. As you move through, you can see and hear the guards below enforcing the lockdown. And the people are not exactly pleased. After sneaking through streets and alleys, you get to this jewelry shop. Here the game sets you free a little bit. Here you uh, get to use the focus ability. It highlights items in the environment that you can interact with but it drains your focus bar. One really cool detail about this level is that the uh, lightning makes you briefly visible. Not enough to alert the guards fully, but enough to make them look twice. Garrett overhears some guards talk about the high price of a mask in the shop. Of course, knowing Garrett, this piques his interest and now you gotta take a look inside. You can get in through the back. This is actually a side objective. The game will give you optional objectives throughout the runtime, but these often end up being more interesting than the main objectives. This jewelry shop really reminded me of Dishonored. Everything from the atmosphere to uh, the stylistic choices. The layout of the shop is actually pretty interesting. It's pretty big and has these overhead beams that you can use to move undetected. When you leave through the upstairs window, you will have gone past the locked stone market gate. Out here, you also find a newspaper that says that this was a very successful lockdown. I doubt the credibility of the writer after the commotion we just witnessed in the prologue. You sneak through some more houses and alleys and you get to the clock tower. Here the lockdown mission ends. Now we can see what you get graded on. There's time, the thief challenges, which will get you more money if completed, and the playstyle diagram. You basically have three areas here. Ghost, which is how little of a trace did you leave. Opportunist, which is using environmental advantages. And Predator, which is how violent you were, how many knockouts, fights, etc. You can also see how much you stole and different stats. After you've completed the main mission in each chapter, you get this segment where you go to various places in the city and talk to people. This is where the open world part of this game comes in. Here you can do side missions, restock, explore, uh, so on. The thing is, the city is very poorly designed, honestly. It's annoying to navigate. They've essentially built pre-designated routes to get to the different parts. This means that when you're going somewhere and you run into a wall, you'll spot that you had to use some scaffolding to get through. So now you have to go all the way back and start from the beginning. This could have been avoided if rope arrows work like in the originals. When you move towards the exit wind window of the clock tower, you get a uh, cutscene. Basso tells you to come see him ASAP via his bird, Genevieve. Genevieve, if you remember, is the name of the woman Basso married in the Middle Age. You get to the crippled Burek where you find Basso. 
Here we find out that a full year has passed since the prologue, and Garrett has no idea what has happened in between then and now. Basso thought both Eren and him were dead. He tells Garrett of the thief-taker general who is hammering down at the moment. Then he gives you a new job. You have to steal a ring from a body at a foundry. After leaving, you can go to the merchant where you can buy items, upgrades for your equipment and new tools. A quick tip, get the wrench tool as soon as possible, it'll come in very handy. Next you visit the uh, Queen of Beggars. She is an old woman that lives in the old chapel. She has ears everywhere. Garrett asks her about the North Crest Mansion incident and whether she knows something about it. She tells him that the Baron and his goons tried to control something they didn't understand and that she, uh, she and the beggars mended Garrett for the year he was out. When the gloom started, he uh, began to wake up. She then leaves him with a warning that there are worse things hiding in the shadows than him. After leaving the queen, you get a focus point. These points can be spent to gain new abilities. After that, you can head straight to chapter 2. Despite letting you go a little, the game still holds your hand. This chapter is also really simple, just like the prologue. All you do is get to the clock tower and reunite with Garrett's gang. As the mission starts, you have to make your way through the scarred so you can enter the foundry. Right here, you notice that in a level which would have been left open in the originals, you still get these markers that you have to follow. That brings me to another gripe I have with this game. The mission structure is insultingly linear for a thief game. As you approach these uh, pipes, you get a flash of Erin. She simply speaks your name. Now you get to a climbing section. This again feels very out of place. During the development they talked about making an Assassin's Creed type parkour system. I guess this is what's left. I think they should have just left it out entirely. It feels very unnecessary. You don't even encounter it that often. Before entering the foundry, you overhear a conversation where a god assures a man that they treat the bodies with respect. But once you're inside, you see that that was a fucking lie. You start by going through this uh, vent where you learn aerial takedowns. You, they uh, draw a lot of attention, but they're cool. The foundry itself is really filthy and dusty. You see how the bodies are treated. It's like a machine in a factory. You make your way through the, some uh, guards and you jump up on these uh, conveyor meat hooks so you can get around the foundry. You get to the first area. A thing I need to address real quick is how this game handles noise. It feels like your steps make no noise unless you move across glass or water. In the originals, it was hard to even sneak up on someone if you weren't on a carpet. Now you can make your way into this office area with some good loot. After that, you come to another one of these corpse duty spots where things get a little tricky. There is this guard just overlooking a lit area where you have to cross. He's right by the light switch. I ended up causing quite the commotion. Eventually, I found out that you can just shoot shoot uh, the light switches with blunt arrows. This brings me to another thing. Direct combat in this game is way too easy. Once you get some decent upgrades, you can almost cut your way through any area. In the originals, combat was simple, but to your opponent's advantage. That made it insanely hard. You find this security door by a sleeping guard. You can use the tower key to get through. Now you gotta get back on the conveyor hooks. By the next stop, you will have arrived by the body you're looking for. You get this cutscene where two guards are inspecting some bodies when the thief taker general approaches our target. At first he doesn't find anything, but then he makes this guy cut deeper. He finds the ring we're after. Then he murders one of his henchmen. Now you gotta go for the ring. You can enter his office through these vents. Inside, you gotta solve this puzzle to get access to his safe. Right after taking the ring, we get a flash of a building and hear the ring owner's name. 
Shortly after that, the thief take a general barges in on you and you gotta escape. The escape section is pretty fucking tense actually. All the guards are on high alert and you're back creeping through the shadows. The last part is also pretty damn hard, but you get out and the mission is over. I'm a 32 year old guy who deals with kids all the time. We're back in the clock tower five nights later. Garrett is burning some wanted posters when Genevieve returns with another message. Basso asks Garrett to meet him in an alleyway with his client. Now you gotta go there. When you leave, you hear this guy yell about the black hand. Anyone caught stealing will be hanged. When you get to Basso, we find out that the client you're meeting is Orion. He is the one leading the revolt against the Baron. When we meet Orion, he is tending to some gloom victims. He's definitely portrayed in a positive light here. Orion blames the Baron for the plague. Garrett says that he prefers to keep to himself, but Orion tells Garrett that he also stands to lose. Garrett hears the echo of Eren's last words to him as he passes out. When he awakes, Orion hands him an unspecified beverage. Now they get down to the nitty gritty. Orion wants Garrett to steal a book from a brothel called the House of Blossoms. He explains that stealing isn't really his style, but it'll be for a good cause. Garrett agrees to do it. After leaving the alley, he remembers that Eren used to go there, and he leaves for her hideout. It's supposed to be here by this rundown mill. While infiltrating the mill, we are introduced to traps. They are all pl pressure plate activated, and the plates display red while in focus mode. You eventually get to this trap door that leads down into the hideout. When you get in there, you're transported to this alternate reality where you see Eren. Garrett is understandably confused, but Eren is almost playing with him. Here, where uh, Garrett says he thought she died, she mockingly throws out the possibility that this is Limbo and Garrett might be dead. She speaks of how much she admired Garrett and then explains that she wants him to steal a key for the truth that he has to find on his own. You find this poster of Garrett. When you press his mechanical eye, you hear Eren scream and you're back in reality. When you walk up to the poster again and press the eye, you find a medallion. Garrett has no idea what it is. When you leave the hideout, you can go straight to the House of Blossoms. Here is where the we really see the game fall flat on its face. They've not only limited the gadgets, but the missions follow a linear structure where you just follow the markers. No exploring, no thinking about what to do and how to do it. The freedom that revolutionized the stealth genre back in 1998 is gone. Don't get me wrong, I am actually enjoying the game so far. Great atmosphere and some pretty cool segments. It's just that it had so much potential that it fails to live up to. Story-wise, we meet the Thief Taker General who will remain a thorn in Garrett's side. Or more, Garrett will remain a thorn in his side, actually. We get the ring for Orion and he reveals what's at stake. He asks Garrett to steal an important book. Garrett meets Eren in an alternate reality where she leads him to a medallion with some symbols on it. Let's go on. First you gotta find your way into the brothel. You have to go through this alley that's riddled with guards. You get up on this beam in the back where uh, you can enter. After going through this dark guarded section you arrive at the brothel. The area itself is pretty well lit. But here in the entrance your biggest concern is just to be seen by one of the workers. You have to get upstairs to the owner's Madame Shasha's room. Eventually, you arrive at an opium pump that's being used by two women. Some guards pass through every now and then, so you gotta take care of it quickly. You can overload it to make everyone pass out. You can tell that they did try to make the levels a bit more full by adding the side objectives, but it doesn't really work in my opinion. Getting upstairs is actually a bit tricky. The staircase has some very inconveniently placed guards. You can sneak your way through this uh, gap in the ceiling. After that you can sneak through these rooms, but they're occupied. 
Imagine just chilling in your room and then unbeknownst to you, some shadow master just moves through without you being able to see. Eventually, you get to Shasha's room. In her diary, you read about a secret passage and now you gotta find it. Using focus vision, you spot it by this picture frame. Behind it lies a dimly lit cobblestone hallway. You get down to this area where you have to uh, find a secret podium where you can insert Eren's medallion. You have to align the symbols though, and to do that you have to peek on some people getting freaky to find which uh, symbol goes where. I really don't understand why it was necessary to sh show them actively doing it here. Once you've aligned the symbols and inserted the medallion into the podium, you can enter these ancient underground ruins. The atmosphere shifts here. It goes from the warm, almost cozy feel of the brothel to these dark, cold ruins. You make your way through more traps until you get to these uh, towers. As you make your way through them, you hear some unnatural beasts hiding in the darkness. As you get out here, you have to do this, this uh, stair puzzle. You have to align them so you can get to the central tower. It's pretty easy, but I somehow managed to spend 10 minutes on it because it didn't occur to me that you have to drop down on one of the stairs. Inside the central tower, you find the book, but it's encased. You have to release it. You use the medallion to do that. When picking it up, Garrett gets a flashback to the ceremony room from the prologue. Here the Baron asks for the keys. As you begin to make your way out, some guards enter, making for a challenging escape. Garrett gets out through an opening under the bed of this room. Some people are reading the Bible in here as well. You find out that it's the Thief Taker General. He gets a little rough with the girl and Shasha uh, barges in threatening with genital mutilation. A fire starts because of the scuffle. Garrett gets spotted and the general flips the bed. But before he can do anything, Garrett locks the general in the room. He escapes and the mission ends. Seven nights has passed and once again you're in the clock tower. Garrett is checking out his arrows when he finds Genevieve mortally wounded. Garrett can immediately conclude that uh, Basso needs help. When you leave this time, you see this guy get rope maxed. A dissatisfied crowd is shouting that it isn't justice. When you get to the Cribble Burick, you find Orion turning the place upside down. The book we got for him is gone, and so is Basso. The Thief Taker General took him and the book. Garrett asks why the book is so important that Basso got attacked over it. Orion explains that it contains the solution to the gloom problem. Garrett then reveals that the book was there all along behind this painting. Garrett wants to know where they took Basso before Orion gets the book back. He's in the keep, but it's tough to get in. He tells Garrett of a Jacob that knows a way in, but he is also kept by the Baron. Before leaving, Orion says that Garrett brings change and the people will thank him. But Garrett then says that Orion thinks too highly of the people by suggesting that. Now we gotta find Jacob so we can get into the keep. The game continues with its linear mission design. The levels themselves are also really small compared to what we got in the originals. It all feels a little lazy so far. We're nearing the halfway point of the game and so far it has completely failed to live up to its name. Story-wise we've met Orion and gotten his book. We evade the Thief Taker General once again. Then we get the unfortunate news that Basso has been taken by him and we gotta save him. Then we find out why the book is so important. It can turn everything around for the city. How isn't explained, but just go along with it for now. As you move through a Greystone Plaza to find Jacob, you see many panicking people. Garrett concludes that Jacob is probably gone. We gotta get to Eastwick, the Keep's architect's house. As you get closer, you can see an explosion from the Keep in the distance. You get to Eastwick's house, but it's heavily guarded. Now you gotta find a way in. 
You can hear one of the guards talk about the place's design, saying there are secret entries and that it's a real house of tricks. Well, that's good to know. We also hear that he's currently hiding in his study. You can get up on the front balcony by climbing up this rope. You can enter through here. When you get in, you uh, can hear some guard shouting at Eastwick to open his study. They get no response. Making it through the house is actually a bit tricky. They do give you freedom, but again, the level is just too small. Eventually, you get to this elevator where you can uh, go straight up to uh, Eastwick's study. Inside, a grim surprise awaits. Eastwick has ended it all. In here, you have to solve this diorama puzzle to get the plans for the keep. You have to align the blocks so the uh, model looks like the real building outside. Right as you get your hands on the plans, the guards break down the door. Now you have to do this chase sequence. Again, it feels very out of place for a thief game. It is a pretty tense section though, but it really robs the game of its character. But you have this uh, kind of funny part where Garrett crashes right into a uh, watch meeting. You land near the keep. Garrett finds out about the uh, Baron's great safe, which he's obviously gonna try to rob. When you get to the uh, keep, you're met with a chaotic scene of raining debris and wounded guards. You move through the rubble where the guards are too done to do anything about your plan. After that, you have this platforming section where you gotta make your way to the keep space entrance. You have to get up this elevator to go in. The inside doesn't look much better than the outside. It's in ruins. You find Basso and you get this uh, cutscene where they sneak through the area. Basso finds out about Genevieve, which pisses him off. Garrett wants to go after the safe. Basso tries to talk him out of it, but Garrett says it's not about the payment, but it's who he is. Now you go further up the keep to get to the safe. During the ride up, you uh, get this view over the keep's great hall. Not gonna lie, this actually gave me chills. This huge room that's in complete chaos. Eventually the elevator stops and you gotta climb the rest of the way. You go through the vents and emerge on the other side. Here you discover the great safe. While entering the combination, a bolt goes through Garrett's hand. It's the thief taker general. He says that he lured him here with the great safe. Guards enter the room. Garrett climbs up onto the safe and get to the catwalk above. You still got a punch in that combination. This part was actually much easier than I expected. Inside the great safe, you find only one primal stone fragment. Upon touching it, you once again enter an alternate reality. Now you gotta follow these poppies through the darkness. In the background, you can hear screaming. You hear someone who's being a little hard on some kids. When you get back to where you were the last time you were here, you hear Erin. She speaks of the pain of listening to these uh, tormented souls. She can't take it anymore. She says to follow her so she can reveal a secret. She speaks of life alone. She asks if she, ca she was the only family Garrett had. Garrett says he tried to help her, but she didn't listen. Erin responds by saying she did the same thing with him. She tells Garrett to go to the Moira Asylum to find out more about what happened while he was gone. Erin tells him to take the Primal Stone and she jumps at him. Garrett wakes up as he falls from the safe. Then we get a cutscene where we look at the carnage. The mission ends. As you enter the open world again, you gotta go meet Basso. As you go outside, you see some revolutionists kill some guards. They are the Graven Mob, and they don't care who you are. If you're not one of them, you're gonna meet the same fate as the guards. You find Basso inside this tavern. Garrett asks Basso if he, he still has his boat, presumably to get to Moira. Garrett just needs to say the word and Basso will be there. The highlight for me in this chapter is the design of the keep. I love the way it looks. It actually looks like something straight out of the originals. The brutalist architecture and the unnatural design of the interior gives a bit of that uh, dreamlike quality that's been missing from this game. 
Story-wise, we save Basso and enter the mythical Great Safe, where we get transported back to the alternate reality. There, Eren tells Garrett that he has to go to uh, Moira Asylum, where he will find out more about what happened to Eren after the prologue. If Eren was here. Immediately after stepping onto the island, you can feel the desolation. You have this super atmospheric section as you approach the asylum. The darkness and the silence is haunting. This is probably the most visually interesting level in the game. It has a very textbook gothic feel to it with the abandoned asylum and the ghostly desolation. Although the entire game looks pretty cool, it all looks the same. It was the constant shift in the environment that gave the originals that uh, dreamy feel that set it apart from a stylistic standpoint. When you reach it, the door slowly creaks open and you can go inside. At this point, I got a uh, sudden urge to play Outlast. Eren jump scares you while you look through a keyhole and tells you that you shouldn't be here. Garrett asks himself whether it's the asylum or him that's haunted. The game basically becomes a horror game in this level. It's super creepy and even though a lot of the scares were very cliche, I still find myself on edge. You gotta get to the female ward to find information on Eren's stay here. When you enter the ward itself, you can look through the keyholes to find various hauntings from the past. You can find various reports around the ward. You can go up to this uh, door where you get attacked by a fire ghost. Eren is referred to as patient 18 in these reports. The Baron ordered that some experiments be done on her. You can see how horrible these people were treated. Now we gotta get to the treatment center which is where these experiments were done. When you get there you have to find room 3F. When you look into the different rooms, you can hear people talk to themselves. Most likely another hallucination. As you walk around, you get flashes from Eren where we can hear how brutal these experiments were. You turn on the power so you can open the doors. In here, we get a vision where we sit in a chair that Eren sat in. The Baron walks in and mentions that the primal is inside Eren. Now it's confirmed. Eren isn't dead, she became one with the primal stone. Now you gotta get to the prison level. Watch out, as it turns out, the inmates here are very real and very hostile. You get to this lab where a doctor was tied up and seemingly drowned by the, I by the patients. When you get down to the prison level, you meet supernatural enemies for the first time in the game. There are these monsters that you can only kill with fire arrows or flash bombs. This section is actually pretty hard because you can't just fight them like the guards if they spot you. Right after that you get attacked by a whole flock of them. They get you and transport you to the alternate reality. You walk through this cell block that's inhabited by petrified inmates. Eren speaks of the pain and mental torment as you walk through. You enter this cell block where it's revealed that the monsters are the prisoners. It seems to be the primal in Eren that's doing it. In the next block you see it as well. Eren says the asylum's inhabitants deserve what they got. After climbing these beds you see more posters of Garrett. After lockpicking the eye on the poster this door appears in front of you. You get back out to the cells where you can enter this one. Inside, Eren is in the corner and you approach her. When Garrett touches her, she screams no at him. We get another vision from her. When all of that shit we saw went down, the Baron saved her, insisting that she is too important. Now we have to investigate Northcrest Manor to see if we can find Eren. The mission ends. When you leave the clock tower, you see a city watch guy get hanged by the revolutionists. The city's power balance is shifting. Like I said, this is the most stylistically interesting mission in the game. The asylum has a very haunting feeling to it. Other than that, it's a little boring. You don't really meet any enemies apart from two sections. Story-wise, we finally get a lead on Eren's location. 
Northcrest Manor. It's confirmed that she's alive and that she absorbed the primal when she fell into it in the prologue. I really wish they had used the alternate reality sections to bring back the absurdism from the originals. They could have really made some interesting stuff. This is probably the closest this game gets to the originals when it comes to the level's design. The manor is pretty decently sized and they let you run free inside. Getting inside is actually a little tricky. The outside of the manor is very heavily guarded, but eventually you get in through the basement. Now you gotta confront the Baron. Navigating the mansion is probably the most fun I had playing this game. It actually started to feel like a thief game. The mansion is quite tricky. There are traps laying around and quite a few patrols. I also discovered secrets. You can find this secret room where you have to align these blocks. I really struggled with this. It took me like 10 minutes to realize I could just look into the machine itself to see if the cogs were aligned. Anyways, I got some unique loot from it. You squeeze into this room where you gotta climb up this vent. Through it, you uh, get to this elevator room. You gotta get to the top. You end up having to climb the shaft itself. On your way up, you suddenly get jump scared by the mechanism. Some people are coming. You just gotta keep climbing. At the top, you find the Baron's office. You get a cutscene. The Baron simply asks Garrett to make his death quick, but we need answers. The Baron begins talking about how he got to this point. The Primal Stone can harness a great old energy that exists in the Earth. He wanted to use it to change the world for the better. Garrett cuts to the chase and asks about Eren. The Baron confirms our suspicion. Eren became one with the primal energy, but, he, but a little twist comes here. Turns out it wasn't the Baron who took Eren from the asylum, it was Aldous, but we know him as Orion, the guy we stole the book for in the third chapter. He's also the Baron's brother. Orion's men begin tackling the manor when uh, the Baron reveals that he was there at the ritual and is possibly planning another. Orion used Garrett. He then says that Garrett is the missing piece. This means that he also absorbs some of the Primal Stone's energy. The Baron sends you back down into the manor where you gotta get through the mob. You gotta get to the ceremony room. But like I said, a pack of pissed off revolutionists are currently swarming the manor. Everything has gone ablaze. Getting to the ceremony room is a pretty hard section too. The guards are already alert and there are quite a few of them. In the ruins of the ceremony room you find a secret entrance to the lab. In here you gotta do this puzzle where you have to break a piece of the primal stone out of its container. You do so by overloading the mechanism so that the glass gets unstable and breaks. The puzzles in this game are pretty easy when you compare it to the originals. When you touch the piece, you get a flash as you're shut off the platform. But now you have it. As you begin making your way up, like an annoying kid that keeps asking if you have games on your phone, the Thief Taker General stops you. He steps on your hand on this ledge. While he's taking his sweet time explaining to Garrett how he's going to punish him instead of actually doing anything, Garrett finds the leverage to evade him once again. After that you have to do this chase sequence where you have to cross the bridge while it's collapsing around you. It's very action packed with all sorts of Hollywood-esque moments that just makes you scratch your head. This section and the chase sequence in A Friend in Need really makes me wonder if the devs actually played the originals. It's so out of place. Once you get across, the mission ends. We're back in the clock tower and Garrett is examining his mechanical eye when an unexpected guest announces herself. It's the Queen of Beggars. She explains that it was the Primal that has been speaking to Garrett. Eren was fused to the city itself. This means that if Eren dies, the city will collapse and vanish. The primal can be removed from her with the remaining three pieces. Garrett has two and he needs to get the third from Orion. Then we can remove it from her. 
The Queen of Beggars then explains that as cynical as Garrett's view of the city is, he needs it to be him. Therefore, he must save it. She vanishes. You go to the cathedral where Orion is and the chapter ends. This was a great level. The level design gets close to the originals by letting you explore the mansion independent from the markers. Right here, some of the linearity lifts. It was a hard level too. The atmosphere, however, is getting a little uh, exhausted right here. Like I said earlier, the entire game looks the exact same from start to finish. Story-wise, we uh, find out that we have to remove the primal energy from Eren so that we can save the city. This is the penultimate chapter. The idea for this level was clearly inspired by the lost city in the Dark Project. The mission starts as you arrive at the cathedral. It used to be a hammer cathedral. The entrance to the cathedral is obviously heavily guarded as it houses the entrance to the hidden city. It's pretty tough and the lightning element from lockdown returns here. This area is super tricky to navigate undetected. Eventually you make it into the cathedral where there's a giant hammer pillar. By hitting this bell you open the gates to the hidden city. You gotta go down the elevator. Getting to it is another cool section. If it wasn't for the obvious pre-designated route and the linearity, this mission would probably be my favorite. One of the saddest things about playing this game is that it had some pretty clear potential to be truly great, but it leans so hard on those AAA tropes that it loses all its uniqueness and character. You get into the elevator. During the descent, you get a clear view over the ruins of the city. You can see the workers work through this long, decomposed corpse of a city. Garrett also says, each city built on the bones of the last. Eventually, the elevator jams and you have to jump off. When you move through the ruins, you once again hear the echoes of the monsters that lurk in the shadows, like the memories of the city itself has rotted away with them. Now you gotta sneak across these uh, wooden catwalks. You squeeze through here to get to the next area. I find these uh, squeezing mechanics quite weird, like why do I always have to push away a beam? Here you encounter more of the primal monsters. After climbing this scaffolding, you get back to the guards. I kinda wish they had done more enemy variety. The monsters put up a real challenge, but with some decent upgrades you can practically just beat your way through the guards. You get to this rotunda. You're getting close to Orion, to Eren. You enter the rotunda where you find Orion amid his ritual. He's giving a speech to his followers. Eren is unconscious on the table where these uh, flamboyant men are about to begin the procedure. Eren wakes up and Garrett is reacting to it. You enter the alternate reality again where you take the primal stone and move through this hallway of statues. You find another piece when you approach the frozen figures of Orion and his henchmen. As you grab the amulet from Orion's hand, Eren's jump scares you. We get back to reality where Garrett is standing with what he took in the alternate. Garrett tells Orion to stop because he's going to kill all these people as they can't handle the primal. Then Eren wakes up and pushes everybody back. Then none other than the thief taker general shows up to the scene. The others escape as the general is about to deal with Garrett. Now you have a boss fight on your hands. It's pretty interesting actually. You can choose whether to sneak away or deal with the general. You have to use the shadows to your advantage. Cause him to lose your position so you can get the jump on him. I chose to fight. After defeating him, you get this cutscene where Garrett explains his rule about killing. Then he says that like Eren, he doesn't follow the rules and proceeds to bash the claw into his head, killing the thief taker general. After that, you leave and the mission ends. This is definitely one of the better levels in the game. It has some really tough stealth sections and an interesting though short boss fight. It is ruined by the linearity. 
Despite this, the design of the level is actually really cool. They utilize the fact that you are, you're uh, basically in a cave to make a more vertical level where you also have to think up and down. I wish they could have made this level more like the previous. Here we catch Ryan in the middle of his ritual with the primal. We stop him, but the thief taker general shows up and he's dealt with. Now we get to the final chapter. This boat, the Graven have been busy. Another of Orion's... You start right where you left off in the previous mission. You creep through this old dark mine evading the monsters. This feels like a throwback to break from Cracksclef prison in the Dark Project. Because this mission starts immediately after the last, you haven't been able to restock. This handicaps you a bit. You get to this opening where you get a full view of the Dawn's Light, which is a boat. It's massive and it is a very cool shot. You have the rain around this boat that stands in the darkness. You make your way to the construction yard. It's not the hardest part of the game, but it's not exactly easy either. You have to get on board the ship. As you move further along, you encounter a merchant who's just stationed out here. I know they did it so you got the chance to restock, but honestly, why is he out here? Who buys clearly suspicious items in the middle of the enemy's base? After that, you gotta get through these guards, and then you can get on to the boat. The inside of the boat has a dark but cozy atmosphere. It's dimly lit and you can hear the storm outside. Here the game lets go of uh, some linearity. It lets you freely roam the ship. This is probably my favorite level in the game instead of uh, a man apart. It's interesting. It, uh, it actually doesn't look like anything we've seen so far. Making your way across the boat to Orion is no easy task. There are many difficult areas to sneak through. Eventually you get to Orion. He is holding Eren. Orion and Garrett have a back and forth and then uh, Orion tries to tempt Garrett with the stone. As he is ranting about his family, Garrett's headache returns as Eren wakes up again. She leaves her body and kills Orion. Then she turns to Garrett. The two fight over whether Garrett was a good mentor or not again. Now you have to do this section where you gotta find Eren and sneak up on her. You have to avoid the monsters as you do so. After this, you get a boss fight. You have to reassemble the stone so you can take the primal from Eren. This boss fight was actually a nice idea. You have to collect the various pieces of the primal stone while avoiding Eren. She can do this thing where she charges energy and if you're in her light, you take damage. You have to stay in the shadows when this happens. This fight is really easy though. Once you understand how she works, you can just steamroll this fight. After assembling the stone, Eren gets weak. She says she's had enough and that Garrett needs to get this over with. After that, you get this cutscene that mimics the prologue. Garrett is holding Eren and she asks for her claw. Garrett instead activates the book and uh, Eren slips. He tries to catch her with the claw, but then he, then he uh, wakes up on the platform the next morning. Then we get this shot of Garrett overlooking the uh, sunrise. The game ends. Haven't seen this much of you in ages. That was the main story. This is an open world game. Like any other open world game, it has side missions. These are basically just fetch quests. Basso needs you to steal something from somewhere in the city. With the map's poor design, you end up spending more time trying to get to the uh, mission instead of doing it. That's it really. Just go here and take that. There are some pretty cool sections where you enter some places that have a bit more complexity in its design. For the most part though, I really didn't enjoy the side content in this game. There is however one whole extra mission that you can do called the bank heist. You have to infiltrate a bank and find something in a specific vault. When you get inside, things get pretty hard. Many patrols and we see the cameras making a return. They work exactly like in the Middle Age. 
when you get down to the vault, you have to solve this puzzle where you gotta deactivate some traps. It took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out how to get past it. Inside the vault you find the Star of Aldale, which is your objective. This mission was actually really cool, it's another one that leans heavily on the original Thief formula. It was however really fucking short. Thief 2014 fails to live up to the originals. It is by no means a bad game. It has great atmosphere and good gameplay, however it is a massive downgrade from the originals, all the way from the level design to the style. This game is insultingly linear for a thief game. One of the best things about the originals was the freedom that it offered when it came to roaming the map and problem solving. In this game it really feels like you're just going from marker to marker. The originals had this dreamy atmosphere with the rapid changes in the environment and the weird enemies. This game looks the exact same all the way through. It has some visually interesting moments, but all in all it's basically just a textbook goth aesthetic. There also aren't any hammers or keepers in this game. A lot of the world building from the originals has kind of been shoved aside here. To give the game where credit where it's due, its story is definitely a top contender for best thief story. Garrett meets his old associate Aaron while doing a job. We quickly find out that Garrett was sort of a mentor to Eren. They have to steal the primal stone from Baron Northcrest's manor. They get to the ceremony room where shit goes sideways and Eren falls into the stone. Garrett wakes up in a cart a year later and is sent home. We, he uh, meets with Basso who is understandably worried. They assume that Eren is dead. Garrett then steals a ring and a book for Orion. Garrett starts getting flashes from Eren. He gets transported to an alternate reality where he sees her and hears her. Eventually he goes to the asylum to look for clues about her. He finds out that she is still alive and assumes th that she is kept by the Baron. Eren became fused to the primal that night. When he gets there the Baron reveals that Orion was behind it. Garrett goes after him. Basically Orion and the Baron are just as bad as each other. Here however we fight to get the primal out of Eren. When we do so we get this scene that mimics the beginning. Here Eren slips and seemingly dies for real. Well that was it for this video so uh, please like, subscribe and bye.